Hi everyone. Today we are going to be presenting information for those of you looking to plan your marketing research career. This is the abridged version of our presentation. The full presentation can be found on our YouTube channel. Before we begin, we just wanted to do a quick round of introductions. I'm Carla Ahern. Uh, I began my career working on-site at Quaker as the project manager for IRI before moving to Knowledge Networks, which is now owned by GFK, where I focused on custom research, research initiatives in media, CPG, and pharma. Prior to Birchworks, I led business development and digital media effectiveness programs for Dimestore Media. My colleague Kit, who you'll hear from very shortly, worked in the marketing re research industry as well with a focus in qualitative research, most recently at Kantar Futures, previously known as the Futures Company. And earlier in her career, Kit worked at True, a boutique insights firm that specialized in youth research. So Kit, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Carla. All right, let's get started. So gone are the days that marketing research professionals land an internship and end up retiring with the same company. It's more important than ever to manage your career and make sure you're making mindful and strategic decisions along the way. It's no surprise that the world is moving and changing faster than ever, and there's been disruption in many industries as the consumer landscape evolves and businesses work to adjust. This has been impacting companies as well as the marketing researchers who serve them. We've seen lots of growth within industries such as technology, e-commerce, entertainment, and gaming. Those areas are thriving, and it appears the momentum will continue. On the other side, the consumer packaged goods industry has been cooling off. CPG used to be the golden industry for marketing research professionals, and it was an aspirational category for many in our field. But today, CPG has continued to struggle as consumer habits change. While it's still a wonderful experience to have on your resume as it's so highly transferable to other industries, the opportunities in the CPG space just aren't as prevalent as they once were. As the marketing research industry adjusts to the world around it, hiring on the client side has really picked up at the junior level. The strategy for many organizations these days seems to be recruiting more talent on the junior end, which is great news for those early on in their careers. On the other side though, this newer take on hiring people that are a little bit more junior in their career has really led to a less is more strategy for senior level roles. So today, there generally tend to be fewer positions for those leading the research teams. Many companies seem to be placing a greater emphasis on soft skills when hiring, so we're seeing some changes here. We've noticed an increase in the steps many employees take to vet researchers before bringing them on board. We're also seeing many companies leverage personality tests, assessments, and other tools used to gauge someone's competence, aptitudes, and work style. So don't be surprised if you're asked to do one of these assessments at some point during the job search. Thanks, Kit. So what does all of this add up to? The marketing research job market is an active one. In our recent study, we found that almost one in every five marketing researchers changed jobs last year. And the average tenure of a marketing researcher is right around three years in a role. The good news is that the market should help to support all of these job changes. The BLS ranks market research as the 12th best business job and predicts an almost 19% employment increase from 2014 to 2024, which equates to roughly 92,000 new job openings. So with all of this talk about switching jobs, you're probably asking yourself, when should I start looking for a new position? And to really boil it down, one of the biggest signs that you might want to start looking for a new role is if you feel like you're not learning anymore and you just feel like you're stagnating in your career. You need to make sure that you're doing the correct career planning so you can continue to improve your marketability down the line. Timing-wise, there's really no black and white answer here, but it's certainly not expected that you're going to stay at one company for your entire career. Don't get me wrong, you don't want to switch every year, you don't want to be seen as a serial job hopper, but it is perfectly okay to spend two, three, four years in a role. It's important to make your moves wisely though. Don't make a move just to make a move, but think about strategic career planning. To use a research term that Kit and I use often, think about the white space on your resume and how you can fill it. As you think about your next move, it's also important to know that others are doing the same thing and to think about how you can differentiate yourself during the interview process. So we wanted to share a few key things that we think are important to think about during the interview process to help yourself stand out and land your next dream job. 
So even before you hop on an initial interview or phone screen or step through the door for an in-person, your resume is going to be the first impression that a hiring manager or a recruiter will have of you. So it's important to make sure it's very good. So outside of the basics, like making sure you have a professional email address, listing methodologies you're familiar with, uh, you, what you really need to do is take a step back and truly think about the content and how you're presenting it. We really always advise people to, to not think about their resume as a job description, so don't have it read too tactical or too executional, but really bring out the strategic elements and talk about and highlight the impact that you've had on the business. Also, be sure to call out progression. If you have gotten promoted a couple of times, be sure to call that out because people love to see progression. They love to see promotions. And lastly, and we know this requires a little bit of work and a little bit of juggling on your end, but tailor your resume if you can. It, it might make sense to have three or four versions of your resume, one for supplier side roles, maybe one for, you know, one for client, one for supplier, one for consulting, one that highlights global. You know, just make sure that you tailor it to the specific role. So now on to the, the main show, the most important part, which is the actual interview. So again, before you walk into the door, make sure that you're doing your homework. That's actually a common complaint that we get from, from our clients is that it's just very evident that someone didn't do the research on the company or the role before they came in to interview. And again, these are researchers interviewing for research jobs, so that should not happen. <laughs> so make sure you do your homework, pop the company into Google, do what you can there. Next, be sure to ask thoughtful questions. These show that you know, you're thinking about yourself sitting in the seat already. They show that you're interested in the company. And people generally love answering questions about their company. And it also gives you a very clear and accurate picture of the situation that you may be walking into. And lastly, be excited. Don't be afraid to, to let you know, your passion or enthusiasm shine through. Because again, our clients want people who are excited about working there. And then you know, after the interview, we recommend sending thank you notes when you can. So thank you notes are a great way to close out the process, you know, reiterate your enthusiasm and your interest level. And you know, perhaps it's a good ex example or, or kind of way of showing um, you, know, you, you, well, you thought about the question a little bit more, you'd like to answer it this way, or maybe you'd like to send over a work sample to demonstrate something that you brought up in the interview. And as Kit alluded to before, in addition to or in lieu sometimes of the assessment phase, we're starting to see assignments being used more and more as part of the interview process. So these can you know, come up at any stage really in the interview process, but usually you'll have at least had a phone screen or an in-person interview. So we wanted to provide a couple tips here, kind of depending on your, your level of seniority or whatever job you're interviewing for, just some common tips that we have found to be very helpful. The first is to make sure that you're dedicating enough time. You know, sometimes the assignment may only take an hour. Sometimes it may take up to you know, 6, 8, 10, 10 hours spread across a few days. Whatever the time commitment is, make sure you dedicate enough time because you don't want to run out of time. Number two, this sounds very basic, but pay attention to details. Don't rush through things. Read the instructions. We hear again a lot of clients complain and say, you know, gosh, I, I, don't, think they, I don't think they read the instructions before they completed it, and that's something to easily avoid. Number three, tell a cohesive story. If you're asked to write headlines on slides or you're asked to come up with an executive summary, make sure that you're not only concisely summarizing the data, but you're also taking it a step further and providing some recommendations. Again, this sounds pretty basic, but be, be sure to check your work. Again, there, there's really no excuse to have your work go un would or something like that. So make sure that you're checking it. And lastly, be sure to take the assignment seriously. I mean, there's, there's a reason that the employer is having you complete this in the first place, and they're going to use it as part of their overall assessment of you as a candidate. And we've really seen this step make or break someone's candidacy. So if you're interested in the role, be sure to take all aspects of the interview process seriously. We think it's important to also make sure we're clear on who we're talking about when we say marketing researchers. The term marketing researchers can include professionals within consumer insights, customer insights, shopper insights, category management, media or audience research, even competitive and market intelligence. At Birchworks, we differentiate marketing researchers from predictive analytics professionals and data scientists. We also don't include web analytics professionals or marketing or brand managers. Great. Thanks, Kit. So after all of the hard work that you've put into career planning, job search, interview process, assignments, assessments, and anything else that may have gotten thrown your way, an important thing to know during the negotiation process is what salaries one might expect in marketing research. So we wanted to give you some benchmarks and high-level takeaways that we thought might be helpful. Looking at data from the most recent version of our salary study, 
you can see median base salaries at all of the job levels we analyze. So this is data from our 2016 salary study that we released in the fall, and we'll be releasing the 2017 data before the end of the year. The full breakdown can be found in our salary study, which is available for free download on our website. If you're not familiar with the report, we cut the data by client side versus supplier side and a number of other variables. So a common question that we get is, you know, should I get an advanced degree? And it's a tricky question as it's a very personal decision because there's a commitment from a time and a monetary perspective. But as you can see here, an advanced degree tends to command higher salaries for researchers. Again, we don't see advanced degrees typically a requirement for roles. They're more of a nice to have. So again, this just so shows the kind of bump it might be able to get you. When looking at supplier side professionals with at least 10 years of experience, advertising and marketing firms pay nearly $25,000 more than traditional research suppliers. When looking at the client side, there are also variances based on industry. When looking at data for the more junior client side researchers here, which it includes up to four years of experience, the higher salaries tend to be in retail and tech, but the highest salaries are seen in CPG, which are about $15,000 more than the other industries. And with all of this talk about comp compensation, we wanted to provide some tips about advocating for yourself and reasonably negotiating salaries, which Kit is going to walk you through now. Thanks, Carla. So regardless of your level of experience, everyone wants more money at the end of the day. But how do you get there? So we've pulled together some tips to help you think about salary negotiation. The first thing we want to discuss is transparency. It's important to be honest, whether you're working with a recruiter, talent acquisition, HR, or even the hiring manager directly. Be open about your current salary and full compensation, as well as what you'd be willing to accept. We know some are hesitant to disclose compensation information, especially when marketing researchers feel they may be underpaid. But knowing the full story really helps us advocate for you. Some job seekers toy with the idea of embellishing their current salary, but we definitely do not recommend lying. You could run the risk of pricing yourself out of a really great opportunity, or worse, if a company asks for a pay stub to confirm your compensation, you could get caught in a pretty st sticky situation. Thinking of market value, it's good to have an idea of your current market value. Our annual salary study is a great jumping off point if, you, if you'd like to see where you fall within the market. Um, but one thing that may impact negotiation is internal salary bans. Sometimes the various levels within an organization have specified salary ranges assigned to them. This is especially true with larger companies. It's great to know a bit about that just so you know if you're maybe rubbing up against limitations. Whether you're in the offer stage with a new potential job opportunity or you want to have a discussion with your current employer about getting an increase, you want to be prepared with specific reasons and examples to help support why you think you deserve the amount you're targeting. Think about how you can demonstrate the value you'll bring to the team or show the impact you've had in the past. It can also be beneficial to highlight your diverse experience. Think about the breadth of data you've worked with, the different methodologies you've mastered, and the various industries or categories you've touched. All of this hands-on experience across a spectrum of different areas can help support your discussion. For marketing researchers, lateral moves are fairly common. It may not be the norm in some other industries, but we often see research and insights professionals take a lateral move at some point in their career or even a potential step back in order to break into a new industry or fill in some white space on their resume. We also see supplier side researchers take a step back salary wise often just to make that jump to the client side. It's a desirable move for many to move into a role on the client side, and taking a step back may seem counterintuitive this point, but it often pays out significantly in the long run. When you're negotiating, it's not always about the base salary. Some companies may not have wiggle room with the base, or they might have limitations based on internal equity or those salary bands I just mentioned. It's important to evaluate the entire opportunity. Maybe the company can't adjust the base salary, but they might have another lever to pull, maybe in the form of extra vacation days or a sign-on bonus or maybe something else. They might have some flexibility somewhere. And overall, don't forget to consider the opportunity as a whole. Maybe it's a great learning potential or there's wonderful growth opportunity down the line. It might fill in this white space that we've been talking about on your resume. These things will likely be worth more long term than a couple thousand dollars in your pocket today. 
And when you're negotiating when it comes to a job, it is not like buying a house or a used car where you negotiate and never see that person again. It's a completely different ballgame when you're communicating with your future boss or potential employer. One thing to consider, if you do decide to negotiate and if that employer is able to come back and, and meet your needs, you should really be ready to accept that offer. It offer, often takes them a lot of work to get the approvals that they need, the different levels that they need to talk to, to accommodate. And if they can make those moves and, and meet your needs, it really leaves a sour taste in their mouth if you decide to walk away anyway. And lastly, in a competitive market like today, you may find yourself in a place where you have multiple offers on the table. It can be tricky to navigate multiple offers, so we really recommend being honest with your potential employer or recruiter. Going back to that transparency bullet, being open about the other offers you have, the timing, and communicating along the way is crucial. If you leverage one against another, it's important to be transparent about the salary and compensation you've been offered. At this stage in the game, whatever company you turn down will likely be disappointed, so being transparent along the way, just so there aren't any surprises, it also allows you to explain your thought process. It can help ease the letdown. And again, never accept an offer unless the decision is final. We know occasionally people do make mistakes, but it's never a good idea to sign that paper unless you've considered the full offer, you've gone through the details, and you're ready to turn down all other offers. And that includes a potential counter from your current employer. Thanks, Kit. So if you're interested in more insights about the marketing research hiring industry, like the ones we presented today, check out birchworks.com backslash blog, where we post periodic updates with hiring market insights and analysis, including industry trends, career topics, shifts in the market, and excerpts from our salary research report. To stay connected and updated with our latest research, webinars, and career advice, you can find Birchworks on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Birchworks is an executive recruiting firm specializing in the placement of quantitative business professionals, typically within the fields of marketing research, analytics, and data science. We're the leading resource for quantitative insights and talent, and produce three comprehensive salary reports every year for our main specialty areas. These reports each contain 30 plus pages of data and can be downloaded for free at birchworks.com backslash study. If you'd like to see what roles if you'd like to see if we have roles that are a fit for your experience or to discuss hiring needs, send us an email at info at birchworks.com to start the process. Thanks so much for joining and have a great day.